once again be in the house of the Lord. It's been a it's been a great week. It's been a very hot week. Actually, it's been a hot month so far. Um, but hope is on the way. Tuesday, we get into summer. <laughs> this is spring weather. We've got the summer to look forward to, and that's, I don't know how encouraging that really is. Uh, it's, it's been one of the hottest springs I can remember in recent years. I just came back. Um, we, Angela and I were able to spend a few days at the camp this week, and uh, it, was, it was kind of an enjoyable time. I was able to link back up with people that dated back 30 plus years into my history, and um, that's always great. And it, the people that you see that you recognize are actually their grandkids. <laughs> so, um, but it, it was a great camp, powerful moves of God, and it let me know that what's going on here is not unusual. It's happening across our fellowship, and God is moving in a special way. Um, so let me be begin today, I, I'm going to begin kind of on a rabbit trail and then make a U-turn and come back to what I want to say today. Thursday of a week ago, um, I was up here at church, well, actually a week and a half ago, I was up here and I decided to run by the Marcelli Plantation and um, check on Bishop's pepper plants that I had given, entrusted to his care, and um, gave him very good instructions. Of course, nobody's been there. And um, w when I went there, nobody had been there for four days. And so I, I walked around the uh, corner of the house when I got there, and what I saw was absolutely terrible. Those three pepper plants that were lush and just green and and um, and just beautiful, when they left, were gone. If you could put that first picture up. Okay. Is it? Oh, okay. Now, the, the, the leaves you're seeing are not that plant. It's that, that's in that box back there. There's probably half a dozen leaves on that plant. And so I, I, um, I said, well, man, I, I can't leave this thing here. I can't run back and forth and make sure it's watered and cared for. And so I just put it in the truck, took it back to the house where I could take care of it while everyone was gone. And it wasn't until I got home and was looking at it closer, actually, when I was carrying it to the porch. Um, put up the second picture. Almost kissed that guy right there. I mean, he was right there on the end of my nose. And I realized, no, it wasn't the dry soil that had brought about the demise of this pepper plant. But it was that tomato hornworm. And um, when they attached themselves to the foliage... You got to look to find them. And he was, he was wrapped right on that limb or that was about the same circumference as him. And I didn't see him until I got a real close up and personal uh, look at him. So after I saw that, I, I took him off there and I ended his greedy eating spree. Because <laughs> literally, I, th those of you who garden know that in one night, that guy right there can completely eat a tomato plant. Or a pepper plant. They don't eat the plant itself, but they will eat all the foliage off of it in, in just one night. This guy had probably been on it too because of the size. It's about three and a half inches long and about as big around as your finger. So he had been eating a while. And so, so they, um, they can literally destroy the foliage off a of plant in a night. So I've, I've dealt with them. I've, uh, my dad, when I was born was gardening and so I took it up and so I, I knew 
what I had to do with this plant. So I cut it back about a third. Because uh, if you look at a plant closely, even though the leaves get, get taken off, there's little nodes where those leaves come out. And if you will cut all the vegetation off of it and about a third of the top of the plant out, then it won't take it long because it's got a big root system down there and it'll push those leaves right on back up. And if you could give me that third picture, after just 10 days, I'm tired of seeing that guy. <laughs> this is what it looked like after 10 days. Um, that, um, I mean, it's completely leafed out. You, you can't quite see it unless you were zoomed in on it, but there's about six little uh, bud pods that's going to be blooming just in a few days. So um, even though this was a rabbit trail, it didn't really have anything to do with what I want to say today, um, I wanted to bring it to you because I couldn't, I couldn't um, pass up the relevance of how similar the tactics of our enemy are. How he will attach himself to, to, a, to our, our lives. We'd do well to guard against the parasitic spirits of Antichrist that in this day and this time will attach themselves to our lives. And before we even know it, our spiritual foliage any spiritual fruitfulness that is on our vine will be consumed. Just like that first picture. I mean, I couldn't, I, I thought it had just died because it hadn't been watered. It hadn't been watered, and it was very dry. But peppers can survive that. Um, this, this was the, the enemy, that, that worm that came in there and tore it apart. Our lives, like these pepper plants, can be rejuvenated once the parasite has been removed. There are so many things in our lives that can attach themselves um, to us, and sometimes we don't even know it. <laughs> you got to put your nose on the end of that dude, and then all of a sudden, man, what's this guy doing here? How did he get here? And I, they, there's a, uh, it would be quite a story to go through the whole process of how they evolved, but they actually many times come, come with the plant, the, the little um, eggs and all that. So just ten, like 10 days after this thing, that thing looked beautiful again. If we will get rid of the things that are attaching themselves to us and, and trying to sap the very spiritual energy out of our lives, then new foliage and spiritual fruitness, fruitfulness will return to our lives. Now, if you could turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 20. I will get into, I have enjoyed in, in, in the last several weeks, I've been reading through that Second Chronicles, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and, um, and when I read, I love Second Chronicles, especially uh, the latter part of it. Uh, there's just, just so many messages you could uh, get into. In Second Chronicles, but let me uh, go to the tenth verse. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God will not judge. Or, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Let me take just a moment, a few more minutes, to bring to you this subject, when we don't know what to do. How many of those moments have I had in my lifetime? Sometimes it seems like they stack up several of them in a, in a single day. But uh, when you look back over your life, you see that there's so many th times when you've reached this place where Jehoshaphat, he, he had received a report. And so 
in order to understand this setting, uh, I just kind of pulled those verses because I want to kind of go verse by verse through some of this chapter. So in order to understand this setting, uh, I want to go back to chapter 17, which is when Jehoshaphat first became king. He followed Asa, his father, who for the most part was a good king. And he followed after the, um, the, the same uh, kingship as David uh, until right, right near the end of his, his reign. The first verse says that Jehoshaphat strengthened himself against Israel. And for the next 17 years, throughout chapter 17, Jehoshaphat sought after the Lord, God of his father, and walked in his commandments. In the third year of his reign, he gathered the chief princes and sent them throughout Judah with the book of the law of the Lord, teaching all of the people. And if you're going to change a kingdom, if you're going to change a church, if you're going to change a household, you've got to get the book off the shelf and get it and begin to present it to the people. So they went throughout the, um, the land teaching all of the people. As the word of God went forth, fear fell on the kingdoms of the lands around Judah. Some of their former enemies brought presents, silver, and great flocks of livestock, even the Philistines. You know what a thorn in the flesh the Philistines were all of, through their history. They brought presents. In the 17th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign, after the blessings of God had been poured out without measure on his kingdom, he joined affinity with Ahab. All of chapter 18 deals with Jehoshaphat's error and judgment because he agreed to fight on the side of the corrupt Ahab at Ramath Gilead. Ahab was killed in accordance with Micaiah's prophecy. And then we get to the 19th chapter where Jehoshaphat returns to Jerusalem. In verse 1 he says, When Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu the seer, the son of Hananiah, went out to meet him and said to the king, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. There is, however, some good in you, for you have rid the land of the sheriff poles and have set your heart on seeking God. And verse 4 is a key verse because it sets the, the mode for that entire 19th chapter. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and turned them back to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So after he returned to Jerusalem, where he received a scathing rebuke for aligning himself with one of the most wicked kings in Israel, Ahab, Jehoshaphat went back to what he knew the best, what he had done most of his life. He immediately went out among the people, turning their hearts back to God. He once again set judges throughout the land in all of the fenced cities, the people throughout Judah were prepared to serve and to trust in the Lord. So by the time we reach the 20th chapter, Jehoshaphat with all the people of Judah had come to trust and rely on God regardless of their circumstances. Verses 1 through 4 announce the approaching forces and coming together of all of Judah to seek help from the Lord. So Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So, when we don't know what to do, we pray. Praise God. Aren't you glad that you have an advocate? That you can fall on your face and you can, you, you can get a hold of God. And it, it's not, sometimes people think it's a cop-out when they give a situation to a minister and, and he says, well, I'm going to help you pray about that. It's not a cop-out. It's the most powerful tool we have in our arsenal to combat life. Beginning with verse 5, 
Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and at Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, now he's talking to God, he's praying, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? He's talking to God, just like you and I would talk. He's asking him some, actually some rhetorical questions. But he's reminding God of, of, of these things. They have lived in and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade. When they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they're repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave as an inheritance. Our God will not judge them. Our, our, our God will you not judge them. For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. They came as families. Everybody in the kingdom was there as King Jehoshaphat prayed. He voiced the sentiment of all Judah when he said, we don't know what to do. But God, our eyes are on you. So every man, woman, and child had their eyes turned heaven in the expectation. They were looking up because they didn't have an answer. They didn't know what to do. Uh, so when we don't know what to do, we turn our eyes on God. You know, it matters uh, where our eyes are focused. If you remember the ten spies that Moses sent out to spy out the land prior to Israel going in and conquering um, Canaan land. And the ten, well, he didn't send out ten, he sent out twelve. The most notable ones are ten, even though we can't call their names, we know what they did. We know their mindset. Their mindset was, we saw all the giants. They were looking in the wrong place. Caleb and Joshua were looking at God because God had promised, I'm going to take care of all of them. I'm going to help you to conquer that entire land. When our focus becomes God and his resources, that's when anything is pos possible. As Judah waited expectantly, God spoke through Jehazi. Um, in verse 15, which is on the next page, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Here again, he's making sure where their focus is. You're, the battle will be taken care of by God if you're focused on God. And then verse 17, you will not have to fight in this battle. So, well, I guess we can just take the next flight out and go on vacation. No. He said, take up your positions. Wait, I thought we weren't going to fight this battle. But the, 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 the man of God was saying, you, have, you don't have to fight it, but you got to be there. you got to take up your positions. you got to stand firm. In other words, wherever they were standing, the position that they set themselves in, they were to stay there and not leave. And if they did those things, he said, you'll see the deliverance 
the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Praise God. He'll be with us, whatever the situation is, whatever uh, it is that we don't know what to do about. Whatever has stumped us, God is in control. When you don't know what to do, worship the Lord. Verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Now, there's a difference between worship and praise. Worship is where we fall down on our face, on our knees. We, we get down and we give God what is worthy, what he is due. So um, when we don't know what to do, we've got to worship the Lord. And there's times when uh, I know we call it um, the, the, the worship si um, singers or sometimes praise singers, but um, there's both going on in a typical service. There's worship going on, and there's also praise going on. And, and, and the next thing that we have to know what to do when we don't know what to do is praise the Lord. Verse 19 says, Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korathites stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. You see the difference in, in, in them praising God and before the, the worship that took place by Jehoshaphat and all of the people. They, they went down on their face because they, they knew what God was able to do and they were, they were worship him because of of his magnificence, because of his majesty. When we praise God, we are actually setting a, a, a parameter for what our expectation is, what God will do. It's akin to an appraisal. An appraisal gives a value to, to, to whatever is being appraised. And, um, and, and our praise is given, setting a value of how we estimate that God is going to move in our behalf, in our lives. And then, when you don't know what to do, have faith in the Lord your God and his prophets. And prophets here is symbolic of the ministry. Um, verse 20 says, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God. Now, nothing has happened yet. They're still preparing for this battle that they're not going to take part in. And so Jehoshaphat is saying, have faith in the Lord, and you will be upheld. So what does upheld mean? That means that their, 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 their position is, is going to remain firm. And then he said, have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Successful would be synonymous with uh, prosperity, prosperous. And so, um, have faith in God. Have faith in his prophets. So when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. That's, that's awesome. That, you talk about a battle, and, and when you read uh, those three verses that I didn't read, 1 through 21 through 23, it tells you how it all happened. Because when they begin to worship and when they begin to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the enemies. First it was Ammon beating up on Moab, and then it was uh, vice versa, and then after two of them were gone, uh, the last ones cleaned up on themselves. And before it was all said and done, somehow or another, um, the last two killed each other. You know, when God's in control, when God is, is, is fighting our battles for us, he doesn't leave anything to chance. He said, I'm going to take care of it. I am going to fight. You're not going to have to, you know, you will participate. You will be there. You will be on location but you don't have to fight it. 
And sometimes we don't have the energy, we don't have the, the power within ourselves to, to, to do battle. And that's when God comes in and, and, and does exactly what he did for Jehoshaphat and Judah and all of Jerusalem. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder. And this is the awesome part. This is, this is the last part of that where he says, Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful or you will be prosperous. Um, and they found among them a great amount of equipment, clothing, also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. That's amazing. So God blessed them. On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Bereka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it's called the Valley of Bereka to this day. Bereka means blessing. So God turned a, a, a situation that could have been just a complete slaughter of the nation of Judah, of the kingdom of Jehoshaphat, all of Jerusalem. They could have been completely wiped off the face of the earth. Because the, the, the numbers against them were so, so huge that uh, they didn't have a chance. But instead, the way God does things, he turned it completely around. And he, he um, turned it into a net blessing. The gross looked like, hey, this is not good. We're not going to get out of this thing. But uh, when, it, when it all, when the smoke cleared from everything, it took them three days just to pick up the spoil. And God ended up blessing them when Jehoshaphat and all of Judah, with their eyes on God, heard the word of God and obeyed. They found themselves in the valley of blessing. And... When they returned to, to um, Jerusalem, where did they go? They went to the temple. They, they brought that blessing that God had given them, and they, they went to the temple with that blessing. And they were praising, rejoicing with harps, tires, and uh, trumpets, lyres. So when we don't know what to do in closing today, what do we do? We pray. We pray. And, and I like the focus that pastor has on, on prayer before services. It's very important. Because what happens here is a direct result of what already happened there. And those of you who, who go by the prayer room, you understand, you know that's true. That God will, will begin the work back there. And then he will continue the work out here. When we know, don't know what to do, we turn our eyes on the Lord. Remember in Matthew 14, the disciples embarking on that treacherous journey across a, a, a sea that was tossed with waves and a storm. And Jesus comes walking. When, when Peter after their initial um, horror and fright in it, when Peter realized it was the Lord, he said, can I walk on the water to come see you? Jesus said, come. And he did. He jumped out of the boat, and he began to walk to Jesus. And as long as his eyes were on the eyes of Jesus, he had no problems with the waves. And he walked because... When we keep our eyes on Jesus, that's where impossibilities become possible. When we don't know what to do, we worship. We worship God. There's times I don't know what to say. I'm not sure. Um, so I, I just follow my face and I, and I, and I worship God. I say, God, you, you, you are this, you are that. And, and, and remember how... Um, Jehoshaphat was reminding the Lord and building up to, to this statement, we, we don't know what to do. He was reminding God of all the things he had done, 
all the things. And when we fall down and worship him, we, we're, we're, we're honoring, we're reverencing him. Uh, Psalm 95 and 6 says, come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Praise God. And we will, when we don't know what to do, we praise God. Psalm 146 and 2 says, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. Praise God. If it's been a while, if, you, if you've had a dry spell, as far as God doing something special in your life, start praising him. Start setting an estimate. Start, start indicating to God what you actually do believe that is, he can do. No, you can't do it. You don't know what to do. But if you will place that estimate, lift up praise and say, God, I praise you for... And then you begin to just praise him for things that haven't happened yet. Things that if you would have been able to do it, you would have already done it. So you praise God for it, and he responds to that. He comes to the rescue. And then, of course, when we don't know what to do, we have to have faith in God. Faith in God. And, of course, right on the heels of that, faith in God will keep us in our position in this life and, and keep us from, from drowning in, in, in life and the happenings of our world. And then uh, faith in the prophet or faith in, in the leadership God has placed over us will, will give us prosperity and blessing. Praise God. Could we stand? Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that we serve a God. You are all-knowing. You are everywhere, God, at the same time. You're all-powerful. God, when, when, we, when we place our eyes on you, Lord, when we worship you, when we praise you, when we, when we give ourselves to you, Lord, good things happen. Lord, you are our king, you are our master, you are our high place, you are our rock on which we can, we can build a foundation in this life. God, we thank you for all that you have done and are doing and will do, God. We praise you, God, for things as yet that we have not seen but we know are possible because we are serving a God who is able to, to do exceeding abundantly more than I could even ask or think. We thank you for your presence today. We pray that you would move in the remainder of the service today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.